are delighted to have with us uh, Pierre France, uh, who uh, is presenting the intriguing title of Twilight and the Weathering of the State Dream. Pierre is uh, a senior researcher at the Orient Institute here in Beirut, where he has been since 2020. He is also a PhD candidate, uh, waiting to defend his dissertation, hopefully soon, um, about the process in which the Lebanese state was maintained and survived throughout the Lebanese Civil War, a fit which today we look at with a lot of excitement as we see uh, the state disappearing. Aside from this work, he has co-authored the New Liberal Republic with Professor Antoine Vaucher at Sciences Po, um, a contribution to the study of the blurring lines between public and private social spheres in contemporary France. He was also junior lecturer in political science at Sciences Po and core fellow at the Camargo Foundation. Uh, so Pierre will speak for about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, after which I'll introduce uh, our two discussants, uh, long-term friends of the Urban Lab, which we're delighted, uh, and new friends, which we're delighted to host this uh, afternoon. So Pierre, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really grateful um, to the Beirut Urban Lab, Mona Fawaz and Mona Hareb, uh, for this um, invitation. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Miriam Katus and Wissam uh, Laham for being here tonight. And of course everybody here uh, and uh, on the internet for making the time to attend this uh, event. I'm almost obliged to start from something that has become commonplace in Lebanon. The discourse on the failed state. This is one example of uh, this discourse that you can find on the internet on a Facebook page in, uh, in 2019. So the idea that there is no state, that the state is weak or feeble, uh, or no, we can even say it literally that the state is bankrupt. Um, a series of observations that are always summarized by the saying Mafi uh, Daoule. Yet there is something else there is another series of observations that is less often uh, mentioned, uh, sometimes in exactly the same, uh, within the same cycles, in the same newspapers, or by the same people, speeches uh, dealing with some exceptions to the rule of the failed state. Speeches that um, foster the idea that there are islands of efficiency and uh, amazing individuals that are able to uh, resist this uh, failed, state, uh, failed state tendency. So here you, you have, for instance, uh, of a of an army officer, or, and um, a tribute to a former uh, director general um, that, uh, that was published in 2014 in Lorient Le Jour. Um, there are many... Um, different um, manifestations of, these, uh, of this narrative of uh, amazing, um, amazing uh, individuals or islands of uh, efficiency through uh, Muzakirat like this, so the memoirs of uh, civil servants and army officers, through the tributes when uh, some of them uh, unfortunately die. Also through the taklim, that is, uh, a type of ceremony that is often uh, taking place at the UNESCO Palace uh, in Beirut uh, in praise of a civil servant when uh, he is uh, retiring. For those of you that are interested, there is one of these takrim that is happening uh, in a few days uh, in Yalze in case, uh, in, case you want to, in case you want to join. The fact that there is this strange coexistence of two uh, uh, discourse, the, the discourse of a failed state and the discourse of uh, these exceptions to the rule of, of the failed state is my, the, the point from, from which I, I want to, uh, to start this, uh, this presentation. I, I think it, it really um, um, it really is a challenge to what uh, to uh, the theoretical framework we are using when you, we are speaking about the bureaucracy and the state um, in, uh, in uh, Lebanon. From a theoretical point of view, it implies uh, several things. First, it seems to me that we are at 
an interesting moment in the history of uh, uh, the changing of theoretical frameworks where there is a pendulum between the fear state and the idea that there is there would be some somehow resilient state so the, I, I don't use this term but there are many uh, discourses now about the fact that some things did uh, function even if there is uh, turmoil and uh, a lot of chaos um, around. Um, I think we should uh, um, really equip ourselves with new theoretical tools uh, as well, maybe as new uh, fieldworks to try to grasp um, uh, this, this thing. Because uh, s to say that there are islands of efficiencies or exceptional individuals um, is not enough. Uh, it is perhaps even more um, perverse uh, in a way that uh, saying that, um, that I think we could say that um, uh, in reverse things are functioning uh, in the realm of corruption or red tape because there are these very tiny islands of e efficiency that make it, uh, make it possible. Another uh, challenge we have is um, to break the idea of the bureaucracy, like a unified uh, bureaucracy um, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. Actually, it became quite uh, a blind spot of the study of the country recently. There is an under-research of what is happening inside um, uh, the bureaucracy, which feeds in, uh, in return, discourses uh, at a global and systematic level, uh, depicting only corruption and red tape without, um, without bringing the details of the everyday of, uh, of this functioning. Uh, the third uh, like theoretical challenge I, I, I would identify is that these neutral persons or neutral spots within the system do have an history that we don't really know of. Um, and it's really tempting now to make some comparisons between the situation during the civil war and what is happening um, right now in Lebanon, although we don't really know if this comparison is relevant or not. Uh, last aspect that is also a bit of a challenge, um, this discourse is a discourse. We don't know what, um, what part of it deals with uh, sociological and historical reality and what part of it is just a discourse uh, that people are endorsing for themselves or for their uh, institution. So how do I uh, proceed from, uh, from here? Um, uh, just a quick, uh, quick note on the field work. It is based on, on uh, the study of the Wuzwu in Lebanon uh, along the years 1960-2005. Uh, 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 a lot of interviews with former director generals uh, and uh, advisors. And uh, the fieldwork uh, mainly consisted during my thesis on studying um, bureaucracies during the civil war and Recently, I moved to uh, another type of study, um, that is the, the study of uh, bureaucracies um, um, in, the past, uh, in the past 20 years with a new, um, a new wave of, uh, of interviews. Um, I will proceed from, from here in, uh, uh, through uh, three major points. The first one is about the this idea of the director uh, general, Mudir Am, uh, director general of, uh, of, a, of a ministry. The uh, second point I want to, uh, uh, to tackle is the case of EDL, that is, I think, one of the most uh, intriguing uh, cases we have of a, of a bureaucracy. And I will move from, uh, the, uh, I will proceed from this case to uh, the um, uh, to the Hariri era, uh, uh, and I will try to um, to question what we know about uh, about this uh, very specific um, era. So let's start with this idea of the director general as a Shehabi preserve. Um, I find it really interesting to uh, 
in, in order to tackle this theoretical challenge, I, I presented you to start from uh, this position that clearly, uh, literally embody the idea of a state in a person. Um, uh, it, it is one of the figures that has emerged from the Shehabi, um, um, uh, a Shehabi uh, work on the, on the memory of the, the, the Shehabi era that dates back from the 2000, 2000 uh, 2010. Um, Yet I will not praise the Shehabi era. It's, it's, it's not my um, uh, my aim. Uh, my aim here, nor that uh, um, in the same fashion I won't praise the idea of resilience or uh, of a golden era of the um, of uh, of Lebanon. Uh, why do we confuse the director general with Shehabism? Because first of all, that was one of the main. Um, one of the main things that, uh, that the Shehab era left, uh, uh, left after he, he left power in 1964. Uh, uh, 1964 yes. um, we tend to associate Shehab with institutions like uh, the Public Service Council or the, the Central Inspection. Yet, the, one of the main institutions that had the longest life uh, uh, after the, the, the pure Shehab era is the, uh, is the director um, uh, general. Okay. Um, so according to the narrative of the, mostly the Shehab, the, the uh, former Shehabi uh, director general's or officer or uh, uh, the, the, the Fondation Shehab, something happened in 1959 because of the law on the civil service. And um, that was the, the, the ascent of a certain position within uh, the bureaucracy that uh, was completely new with a very powerful individual running, um, uh, running uh, a ministry. Um, actually, I, I think we, we should interpret this uh, more broadly than the strict legal framework that, uh, that is uh, being put forward uh, most of the time. What Shehab did, did mostly uh, in 1959 is that he relied on uh, a cohort of young uh, graduates, from, mostly from French uh, universities, that um, were really interested about challenging positions, and that uh, and who came in a certain uh, as a certain uh, mass of individuals that were really available to to fill in some uh, new um, new position. So there is a sociological and historical uh, history behind the the, the Shehabi uh, the Shehabi narrative that is uh, often. Uh, 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 not very um, uh, put forward. Um, this ascent of uh, the director general comes two ways. The, the first way is that uh, Shehab was clever enough to uh, connect himself to a, a new generation of traditional elites that move to uh, uh, new diplomas to to be graduated from uh, the USG to become uh, engineers, uh, um, especially, and this mass effect uh, was in a second time amplified by a forgotten institution that I think has a, a huge importance. That is, the National Institute of Administration and Development. That was one of the main uh, institutions she had uh, created, and that's a school for top civil servant that uh, continuously operated until um, the civil war and had this very specific position and a uh, very interesting uh, function of bringing to the state um, uh, middle class young uh, graduates from especially the Lebanese University, rather than only uh, the elites. So there is a Shehabi history at the very beginning of the, the Shehab era. And then there is another history 
the, the institution he created that is the long run of, um, of Shehab and um, that deals with the, um, uh, the education of a new generation of civil servants uh, based on the fact that there is a growing middle class uh, in Lebanon that is looking for, uh, for new jobs. Oh, I give you two examples of the first, um, the first kind of profiles that she had brought uh, to the state, Badi al Houd ou Fouad Bizri. Both of them uh, worked at uh, Electricité du Liban and, um, and had uh, held positions uh, in the technical um, uh, institutions uh, uh, dealing with water, electricity, and, and the like throughout uh, uh, their careers. So, um, as you can see, these are, um, I won't come on too, too, too long on this, but these are very high profile um, uh, individuals who made it to uh, French uh, top engineer schools and then came back, um, came back to Lebanon. It is a bit different when you take the other kind of uh, uh, Shehabi uh, director generals, who uh, the, the, the the kind of which I had, had been trained at the uh, at the new institute, because uh, most of the time at the new institute, uh, people were starting the, their career as teacher in the rural areas in Lebanon, and then moved to a low degree, and then passed uh, an exam to uh, become officially uh, a civil servant. Um, yeah, so uh, there are several ambiguities in this history. The first one is the historicity of the, uh, of the, the Shehab uh, era, because as you can see, their careers started way before 1958. It means that there were some director generals before Shehab, but he, would, he was lucky enough to arrive at one point in time where there were several candidates and a lot of uh, and a massive number of young graduates uh, to fill over new positions that he, that he was uh, creating. Yet, especially in the case with uh, Badi al Ahoud, you can see that there were things at the intersection between uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon, uh, things dating back from the mandate period. So it's not something that she had. Uh, she had created, but he benefited from a sedimentation effect uh, of uh, several uh, decades. Um, the other point is that um, before Shehab, just before Shehab, there was Camille Chamon, and Camille Chamon already tried to connect himself with a new generation of graduates, but from the AUB and from the English educated side of Lebanon. Uh, he was, I think, unlucky in a sense that there wasn't enough graduates at that time compared to the, the French, uh, uh, the French side, and people were not interested as much as the, uh, the French educated people were. But um, uh, she had in inherited a series of studies, for instance, about what the administration should be, uh, that were of a great importance to explain how, uh, how it uh, developed uh, starting 1958. Another problem is that praising this figure, uh, this uh, position of the director general comes with a few, uh, let's say, um, uh, shortcuts. Um, when you praise the head of the administration, uh, you devaluate at the same time the ordinary administration that was uh, existing at the time um, uh, it, in Lebanon. And the, um, the insistence on this uh, position of director general masks the fact that there, were, that there was a lack of personnel in the administration for other um, positions. Here, you can see in 1980, um, uh, so a few, a few decades after uh, Shehab, of course, 
but uh, at the time there, there wasn't any new hiring in the in the administration that the proportion is really um, uh, disproportionate l l l let's say uh, there is two um, there is three percent of top civil servant twenty percent of middle managers and seventy eighty percent of people uh, that are really fourth or fifth uh, category uh, inside the um, inside the the administration at the same time in 1980 if you take the case of france uh, that is closer for um, obvious historical reason to uh, this uh, legal fr framework. It's more or less 20% top civil servant, 40 middle managers, and 40 um, uh, uh, class C. Um, it's called like that in uh, in France. Um, uh, class C um, civil servant. So there is there is. Uh, the, 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 um, the director general is a solution and at the same time one of the source of the main problem of the, the administration that is there is only a head and no one uh, no one after him no no middle managers in the um, in the Lebanese administration uh, in practice also it poses a, a series of huge problems the first one is that they are not appointed by uh, making a concours or uh, an exam. They are appointed because uh, most of them were called by Shehab himself who proposed them uh, a position. And most of them, when they are telling you the story, they are telling you something like, of course, my intention wasn't to become a bureaucrat and a civil servant because it wasn't an interesting position. but." He was highly paid at that time, twice as much as the private sector. And uh, none of them did refuse the mission that were given directly by the, uh, by the president. So it's not really the type of um, hiring that you see in Max Weber or um, that you imagine as a, a bureaucracy that is being um, uh, run by um, uh, procedures. It's really, from the beginning, very personal. And it becomes also personal in the way these uh, director generals are running the show in their own ministries. Um, although they are um, uh, most of the time highly competent, uh, they turn, for most of them, their ministry and Sometimes it's uh, it's really worth mentioning that it's their ministry because they created the ministry from scratch, so they have an attachment to it that is uh, far beyond the usual type of attachment you can find uh, among civil servants of, uh, or engineer. Uh, they turn it into fiefdoms most of the time that they don't want to leave for uh, sometimes 20, 30, 40 years of time. Um, they also run the show in a way that is some, somehow authoritarian and really paternalistic. With um, it's really funny when you when you see. I, I don't think I, I put it in the in the discourses. Uh, no, not not in the slide. But uh, uh, it's very much a manly figure. You have to be a man to be a director general. And the way they are depicting their own job is very is very much of. Um, um, uh, being a man in an administration and being being able to uh, to be more powerful than the the civil servants that are often depicted as uh, completely dumb. Um, these director generals, most of the time, are depicting things as old bureaucracies where they are tr that they are trying to circumvent. That's also one of the major ambiguity of the, the way um, they are working on a daily basis. And I show you this, uh, that I really, uh, uh, this contradiction through this, uh, this, uh, this discourse, most of them will, will tell you, or will, they wrote in their memoirs that uh, actually they were independent. And they made a point of staying independent and uh, 
uh, refusing the the, uh, the political interventions that uh, um, happened uh, every day uh, in the ministries. Yet, most of the time within exactly the same interview or the same memoirs, you find these two situations. The first one is, of course, I refused any intervention. The second one is, I did it, but very wisely. I circumvented the law, but very wisely and for a good reason. This means that these, um, they're, they're not, I mean, they're not, these are not contradictory statements. It, it means that um, you adapt yourself to, to every situation as a director general. You're very adaptable and you have somehow the social, economic, or um, uh, family-related capital to resist political uh, interventions uh, sometimes, if you want to resist, um, to resist them. So to conclude just on this, uh, on this part, it is a position that from the beginning is firmly rooted in the Lebanese system as much as it is a game changer. And that's very ambiguous in this, uh, in this regard. It's, it's, it's part of the solution and also on a daily basis, part of, uh, of the problem, based especially on the testimonies of um, uh, less prominent civil servants that used to work with these director generals and sometimes have uh, mixed memories, to say the least, of uh, the way they, um, they interacted with them. So a position that is uh, a bit independent and at the same time very flexible, depending on um, what you what you want to do uh, with it and um, your uh, personal um, uh, limits. So let's just finish in this case on um, the idea that this very powerful position did uh, change uh, over time. Uh, first of all, it didn't really change at the very beginning of the civil war. Um, this, uh, the historicity of the state penetration, the way militias, but also uh, private actors did penetrate the state and did took position, uh, did replace some uh, director general, doesn't start in 1975 most of the time, but 10 years later. So it took re really a long time to uh, come to the point where uh, political actors decided to replace these uh, director generals. And uh, for some of them, it happened in the mid 80s, for others in the mid 90s. So it's really late in the, in the course of the, of the history of the Lebanese wars. Uh, so I pass on this, I, I will go back uh, after. Um, during, right, I, I, I took the case of ODL, for instance, I, I find, find it very uh, tremendously interesting as a case in point. Um, uh, at the beginning of the civil war in 1977, 1980, uh, the, first, uh, the first part of the, the interview, there is this decision that Okay, there is political intervention, but it is somehow uh, compatible with the vision of ODL. So there is a, a bit of pressure from the, from the Lebanese forces to do this uh, development of the Zoo plant, but uh, it was part of the plan of ODL before the war, so it's not really a problem. Something else happened 10 years after and it has to do with the penetration of politics on very technical uh, aspects of uh, public policies that were left aside of, most of the time, left aside of the, poli uh, the political problems uh, before this. Um, at one point during the war, someone decided that they should, they should change uh, the power plants from fuel to um, too cold, which is technically a nightmare. So they finally refused because it was impossible to do it. But 
it was a huge turmoil uh, inside um, inside ADL. And as a way to accompany this movement of uh, the penetration of politics, you can see that um, the social profiles of the director generals, but also the number of years they stay in power really changes over time after 19, uh, after the mid, uh, the mid 80s. Uh, Adele is a, a very special case. There is no other uh, bureaucracy with such a, um, a rapid uh, turnover. And there is a changing of the social profiles at, this, at the very same time. If you take, by, for instance, um, uh, the fourth, uh, for um, director generals until Jean Layoun, they are all trained engineers who did their career inside ODL. So they, uh, it's upward mobility inside the institution. With Mohib Aitani, it's a bit different. Mohib Aitani is someone who's coming from Saudi Oger. And Saudi Oger is coming uh, with uh, Haredi and with the idea that people from the private sector will take over from um, uh, from the uh, from the, 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 the typical uh, profiles that uh, used to run the, um, the state so I I, fin I finish on this unfortunately I had planned too much things to say <laughs> sorry <laughs> and uh, thanks again for uh, for the invitation thank you so much uh, Pierre for uh, this presentation that leaves us with uh, at least as many questions as answers, both in terms of uh, what we th sometimes think of as heroes who are uh, trying to save or build some pieces of the state. And uh, on the other hand, this whole world of the political and how they both live within uh, the institutions of the state. So to comment with us, I am very happy to introduce this afternoon our two discussants. Um, our first discussant is uh, Dr. Miriam Catus. Miriam is the regional director of the Institut Francais du Proche-Orient, IFPO. Her recent research focuses on the comparative analysis of the social issues specific to contemporary neoliberalism which constitutes the subject of her HDR thesis from Morocco to Lebanon a new grand transformation. Her work addresses the precarization of social protections, not on the margins, but at the heart of public institutions for socialization of risks by taking the discussion to fields left in the shadow of major comparisons on the welfare state. Um, she's leading a project to that end with the CNRS recently. Um, so Miriam, Seven to ten minutes of uh, response, please, uh, to Pierre, and then we uh, move to our second discussion. Thank you, uh, Pierre, uh, for uh, your presentation. So I will try to react, um, I hope, um, not in a too uh, messy way. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's uh, just a way, of course, to uh, to open the discussion and to introduce some uh, element uh, for a, for a reflection uh, on state in Lebanon, of course, but uh, maybe uh, also on uh, what uh, is uh, really missing, I think, uh, in um, our social sciences uh, in Lebanon, but also in uh, all the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, instead, during years and decades, uh, we, uh, we, we go, um, I mean, a lot of work uh, was uh, lying on the ideas, on the idea that uh, the strong state, not in Lebanon, eh? <laughs> but uh, that the strong state was um, lying on social contract and mainly uh, on the fact that if there was not a lot of social rights, there was social rights in public uh, employment, in public job. And the fact is uh, there is not a lot of study on what is going in bureaucracy, civil servant uh, and uh, state action 
in this in this country. So uh, my my uh, sorry for my English. And if I'm not clear, uh, I'm, I go ahead. <laughs> so um, uh, for me, uh, one of the interests of what you you do, uh, Pierre, and what you presented to us is to uh, open this uh, box and uh, document uh, who were. Uh, these uh, civil servants uh, during the civil war uh, and with no anachronism with uh, what is going on now but of course we have in mind <laughs> what is going on now and I think that uh, we will discuss a lot of that um, and uh, how to connect uh, this documentation with a more theoretical um, approach of uh, what is a state, how is uh, the state uh, uh, building, build, and um, what can we say about uh, this kind of state, uh, failed or not failed. The connection between a uh, civil servant, so the general di director, and the middle class, because it is very often uh, associated, but uh, uh, in Lebanon today, uh, I would say that we, it seems that we are discovering uh, the middle class and the bureaucracy because they are supposed to die today. So, um, yes. So, um, could you could you uh, could you develop a little bit more on uh, how why? and uh, to what extent uh, the people and the groups you are working on could be considered as uh, groups of the middle class. Yesterday, but also maybe uh, today, uh, because uh, of course, and we have, uh, uh, it's not, I mean, we, we all have this in, in, in mind. My second question is the status, because you didn't say a lot of that. It it appear it seems to me that a lot of people uh, employed by the state in Lebanon, but also elsewhere, are not civil service are not civil servants uh, in a strict sense. Huh? Yes, they are contractual, so they do not um, have the same uh, protection. Huh? They don't have the same protection, and so. And I think that is uh, because uh, um, it's some issue that are really, uh, I, I mean, I am very interested in this kind of issue, but I think it's one of the, uh, of the main point today, and maybe it was one point very essential uh, during the Civil War. So who are, th uh, what kind of rights have this uh, general director? Uh, and my my uh, I sorry I I lost my uh yes my my uh, third question I, uh, is relying also on the this uh, social pact that seems that seems to be uh, broken today uh, for sure, but very uh, challenge during the civil war, so. Uh, just as uh, for the middle class, uh, one tendency could be to consider uh, this bureaucracy or uh, civil servant group as a whole very homogeneous and very loyal to the state. Huh? Uh, it's this idea that uh, it's a way to, uh, to buy the uh, civil peace. Hmm? Uh, to, uh, um, so my question is, uh, uh, what are the voices inside the group, huh? uh, what kind of rights are they asking for, what kind of division, what kind of resistance, uh, what kind of exit, uh, voice, etc., etc. I mean, what is, uh, is, it, is it a non-conflictual group? So our second discussant, 
this afternoon is Dr. Wissam Laham. Wissam uh, is a political scientist with a focus on constitutional law and political order, author of a number of research studies addressing the role of religion and constitutionalism, civil values, political reform, and monetary history of Lebanon. He holds a PhD in poli sci and writes frequently on issues related to Lebanese constitutional practices. Um, he's also a researcher for the legal agenda, specialized in constitutional and parliamentary affairs, and teaches political thought and Lebanese political regime, oh my God, at the, at the, at this, at the USG uh, in the Political Science Institute. So thank you so much for being with us. We're thrilled to hear your comments before we give the floor uh, to Pierre, to, for Pierre to answer you. So... Uh, Thank you all. Thank you, Mona Harb. Thank you, Mona Fawaz. Thank you uh, for uh, for the generous invitation. I am delighted, of course, to be with Miriam Catus and to discuss the paper of my dear friend Pierre France. Uh, I first came to know Pierre uh, many years ago, approximately 10 years ago, and when he was an exchange student. And I remember one time, because I am, as you heard, a constitutionalist, to my greatest joy or dismay, uh, so we were discussing how was the state operating during what we call the Civil War. And I was talking to him and explaining the constitutional intricacies and talked to him about something called a flying decree. So when the Council of Ministers was not able to convene like today, how ministers accepted, created a practice, not that constitution, a constitutional, that a decree that needs the consent of the Council of Ministers should be signed without the uh, uh, reunion of the Council of Ministers by a policeman who will take the decree and visit each minister, and each minister will sign the decree, and thus the decree will be published in the official gazette. That's what's happening now nowadays on the constitutional level. So, and and we discussed the idea of how did the state continue to f during the civil war, and the decrees being signed, and given a proper constitutional uh, justification to publish a decree signed in this way. So this triggered, I think, this the broad discussion and research that Pierre is pioneering about the bureaucracy and the state during the Civil War. So my remarks to, uh, to Pierre, when I read his paper, first of all, there is theoretical remarks. It's clear that the work of Pierre France can be considered as a part of the discussion of the dilemma between weak and strong state. In Lebanon, we also we always hear that uh, Le Lebanon is a weak state in scholarship. It's a weak state because it's a segmented society. It's a weak state because of uh, foreign intervention. It's a weak state because of neoliberal policies of laissez-faire economy, where state does not intervene in economy. So, new trends in scholarship tend to dismiss the idea of weak state of Lebanon as a weak state and try to show that even a weak state has repercussions on state and society and economy. So this is what is called the state effect, that, uh, that state produce a language of stateness that change, that, that challenge the weak, strong categorization. And what Pierre is doing about the figure of director general can be understood from this standpoint. And I find that what Pierre is doing also is a Foucauldian approach. So like Foucault told us that uh, we should not concentrate on the state from the Weberian approach. So the state was a monopoly of legitimate violence, army, security, the state as something hovering above society, as something above society and intervenes in a massive centralized way. But no, we should see the state approach not as an autonomous apparatus, standing over society, but rather through the process by which they become incorporated into society. Stateness, the state live inside us and reshape our form how to consent to reality. So state is not ministries only, is not uh, simply in a faraway place, but the existence of a state, even if something that we call, we deem a weak state has an effect, and we can see this effect in economy, some pioneer research on the role of the central bank, showed that it was not at all weak and it is the existence of such an institution created by the state that ensured the endurance of the economy dominated by the bourgeois, the economy, the Lebanese economy dominated by capitalism and everything that we uh, inherited from the French mandate. So from the theoretical standpoint, uh, I find that the work of Pierre is, is exactly a continuation of this 
uh, challenging the idea of Lebanon as a, as a weak state and uh, showing us that even a weak state can exercise power in a diffused way, Foucault. And what is more interesting is that I compared what uh, Pierre was writing with other authors, other thinkers. For example, uh, Walid, Walid Hasbun and Simon Tollens and uh, Samir Hermes all talked about the dilemma of the weak state and they even invented the notion of hybrid sovereignty. So the state, the idea of absolute sovereignty that we inherited from the French mandate, a state is either absolute sovereign or nothing at all. No, they showed in the research something called hybrid sovereignty, how state and non-state actors can cooperate sometimes to achieve certain uh, repercussions, certain, certain elements. So the work of Pierre is also, I, I find, to tend to see it, that is in this uh, approach of sovereignty is not something a state separated from society, whereas state and state actors need to negotiate, need to find a common ground even during, uh, uh, du during war. So this is the main theoretical uh, approach, I guess, when talking about uh, Pierre's paper. Second element, I have a lot of uh, elements, but uh, no, I will try to respect the time given to me, dear Mona. So second element, the most uh, intriguing one, is about the autonomy of administration. I find it very uh, interesting because Dominant scholarship, yeah, and like the book of Michael uh, Johnson, uh, Class and Client in Beirut or other, will tell us that under Shehab, because you focused on Shehab, the state uh, realized, achieved in Lebanon what we call the relative autonomy of administration. Autonomy became, having an autonomous administration from political decision is a way to say that the nation state, that the state as a centralized bureaucracy is a success. And it's not succumbent, it's the, it does not succumb to the whims and the dictation of the political leaders. So, but wha what you said seems to deconstruct this idea that under Shehab such an autonomy was realized by saying that even the, it's not the autonomy that uh, Weber talked about bureaucracy, but it's another form of autonomy. So it's not the autonomy that we can say that shaped the, uh, the state uh, in the Western sense. And what makes this even more intriguing is that the, talking about the autonomy of administration, if you take the French Constitution, Article 20 of the French Constitution, it's, it's remarkable. It says in an unprecedented way the government disposes of administration and the army. Generally, you can find the term the government disposes, dispose the force army. So it disposes of the army, but they added in 1958, it disposes of the administration. They treat the administration like they treat the army. They can address injunction like they address the army. So is, is the administration in France autonomous? Is it under the, is it autonomous like we say in Lebanon under Shehab or now in Lebanon? So if it is not autonomous, what is the problem in Lebanon if you don't have an autonomous administration? If the political order can dispose of the administration in France like it disposes of the, the army, why can't the political leaders in Lebanon dispose? Where is the problem here? Is it clientelism? Is it corruption? Is it confessionalism? What makes Lebanon different if it's legally the same thing? It disposed, disposed. So it's appalling under the word is... is uh, so, and even in Arabic we have it, but not for the administration, for the army. So, so the idea of the autonomy of administration as a, as a, as an as invention of the Shihabi era, I find that something that needs to we rethink about it, especially that when the Shihabi uh, government took the legislative decrees that installed uh, that created the civil uh, service, the Council for the Civil Service, and the Central Inspection. I remember I was reading in the Compte Rendu, les, les minutes, the, the, the minutes of Parliament. Uh, so deputies, when they discussed these uh, laws, they said, you know, we can't accept such laws because they give too much autonomy to administration and they limit the power of ministers. Ministers have a constitutional power under Article 64 of the Constitution that became today Article 66. 
that they are the head of their ministries and they, they are the one who should choose and nominate and appoint their functionaries and their employees and not uh, be uh, dependent on the will of an administration. So it was considered, as, and you said it in a very fast way, that the post of director general is a way pour endiguer, to contain, to contain the minister. It was considered as a way to contain the authority of the minister. And as you said it, it was more interesting that uh, uh, during the war they retained much part of their prestige and importance. And the director general used to consider himself more important than the minister in the 60s and the 70s under Shehab. But nowadays, the director general in Lebanon lost its importance. It is the minister who is more important than the director general, politically speaking. So that bids the question why? Because administration lost its autonomy after the war and it's, they are all under the patronage of the leader, of the zaim, of the boss. So this, I find it a very interesting uh, idea that you may address, the autonomy of administration and uh, the idea that the director generals nowadays lost their importance compared to the 60s and 70s. Is it really what happened or is they a way they want to represent themselves as heroes? Because they are the heroes, they are saving the state and it was not that sad. So my final remark, I have a lot of remarks because it's, it's very rich, it's a very rich article that even begs uh, theoretical questions. Yani the state that needs the state as an apparatus of legitimacy. So when I was reading this, I remember the Ottoman era. The Ottoman era, the feudal lords in Lebanon, what we call Lebanon, used to quarrel among each other, kill each other, attack the Ottoman Empire, wage war against the Ottoman Empire, but they all, at the end, needed a decree from the governor or the sultan to have an official position. They all wanted a rubber as a stamp from the central authority to give them legitimacy. So state, as, uh, as a creator of legitimacy of, of such powers. Yani. Why do they all need the state? And you talked in your paper about the rubber stamp. So someone invented a rubber stamp, used a stamp. Uh, so, so this is, a f I guess, the final idea. No, f final idea, I remember things. So you said that the state did not replace, uh, militias did not replace the state. A very interesting idea because all Lebanese uh, militias replaced the state. Now how militias and state and bureaucracy tended to cooperate. But in some certain areas and in regalian uh, prerogatives and uh, currency, they didn't issue their currency. But I can tell you from my own personal experience, not during the war, but as a numismat uh, and a philatelist, uh, the phalanx and the Lebanese forces, but the phalanx created their own postal service. In 1975-76, you can find letters sent from Lebanon to Rhodos or Larnaca. They had a postal bureau in Rhodos or Larnaca only, where you have a stamp, Barid al-Kataib, Sha'bat, Dayat, Kiza, this village or this village, with uh, stamps. So if you are in France and you want to send a letter to Lebanon under force, Lebanese forces or phalanges control, you send it to the Larnaca office, you find a French stamp, sent to the uh, bureau post, mail post in Larnaca or on Rhodes, and it's delivered through the Falange uh, militia to Lebanese. So postal services, in a way, w that is essentially a regalian uh, uh, of sovereignty, was replaced by uh, a militia. So I find this very interesting. I guess that you can add it to your research. And I can give you even a photo of an envelope, a cover that traveled. Uh, with a stamp. And thank you for your time. Uh, uh, no, no, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, thank Good you. luck. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> these comments and, and question. Um, so, um, so first thing, first, the connection between civil servants and middle class. Um, as I said, there is this uh, there is this forgotten story of uh, the, the Shehabi era uh, of uh, this uh, school that really is uh, the, the most important uh, institution when it comes to educating the, uh, the, the middle class and uh, making it easier for the, for the middle class to join the civil service. 
Um, so there was a clear idea that is not uh, today the, the target of uh, some memory policy from the the, the Fondation Shehab or any actor of the this era. It, 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 it's they have no interest in this because most of the people that are involved into this uh, uh, fostering of uh, memories from the 60s and 70s, they are from the elites. And uh, um, and um, their history of these elites is more complicated because there is an abandonment of the state after a few, uh, a few years. Um, for instance, even... Um, even before Hariri, that is often uh, associated with the idea that uh, there, there should be more private sector in, into the state. I, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but uh, I had it prepared. Uh, in 1977, when they are creating the CDR, and the Council for Development and Reconstruction, the idea is to bring the private sector a new private profiles and uh, English educated community. Uh, so there is Hariri before Hariri. Just Hariri was the... The guy who did it, I don't know why, I don't know if it's by chance, if it's by talent, but the idea was in the air for a long time uh, that, the, that yeah, the elites were moving to the private sector and under certain conditions they would move back to the public as director general, but most probably as advisor or expert, and then you would move back to the private sector. So there are two intertwined stories of the middle class that is uh, silent about its own history within the state and the elites that are telling us a story about what the state could have been, what I sh what I could have done uh, uh, had I had the chance to had I have the chance to to be a director general uh, without Hariri or without the war. So we don't know much to to sum to sum it up uh, about the, this history of the middle class, but it's really uh, I think it's one of the most important. Uh, uh, history that we should write about. I mentioned these director generals because they are really easy to study. The only problem is that they don't want to talk because for most of them it would be too dangerous uh, because of the politicians or they feel like they, like this or because of the director generals. And uh, um, it's a limitation of my field work. I started with the director generals so they they give you numbers of their former aides or uh, second in line and then you meet the second in line and they're like yes yes uh, the director was really great and, and you understand that they they won't tell you what really happened because it's really impossible to write about this uh, this history um the status of these um these civil servants just a quick slide back to one of the slide no no oh no it's not working anymore no no no, no it's uh, the, just uh, this slide on the. Um, yeah. <laughs> just for a number. This one. Temporaire. You see, even before, or oh, during the Civil War, it's, it's in 1981, the number of uh, temporary uh, positions was enormous. And there wasn't any debate about it at that time. The debate came later after uh, after the Lebanese wars, uh, but it is a technique that uh, Sleiman Frangie, uh, the Sleiman Frangie era, uh, perfected uh, for like six years just before just before the war. He, he and the not so many people he had around him circumvented the the Shehabi institutions because it was customary to dismantle all the institutions that your predecessor had made. And Shehab did the same with the Shamoni, uh, the Shamoni era. Um, and I lost my paper. Um, <coughs> about the homogeneity, um, um, and I think uh, your question is related to syndicates and union unionizing maybe and conflicts inside the state, uh, they are less and less vocal now. Um, and I've, I've tried to follow all the multiple unions that had existed. For instance, in ODL, it's really interesting because it was super unionized before the civil war. And then 
something is happening uh, during this uh, 15 years that is really hard to follow. You you see some uh, new unions in uh, um, not uh, for, for instance in the north in the water authority that are still a bit autonomous or uh, electricity uh, authority that are still uh, autonomous and not uh, being taken over uh, taken over by 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 EDL. But we don't know much about uh, this uh, history of unionizing inside the state. They try to gain the rights that the guys from ODL had, because ODL was a very um, protective institution, and at the same time it was the institution that was uh, dubbed as uh, uh, better than the state. Th it wasn't uh, bureaucracy; it was better than that. Uh, so this is something, of course, we forgot uh, now. But ODL had the, uh, an amazing reputation before the civil war. So uh, many of the smallest uh, electricity, uh, um, not companies, but uh, um, offices, uh, office, no, uh, how, how do we say it in English? Um, no, 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 the office autonome, um, agencies. agencies, agencies. Many of these agencies ask for, uh, for rights uh, uh, comparable to, to ADL. Um, okay, so uh, I will rebound on the many question of, of, of Wissam. Uh, the, the strong weak state debate, um, in the case of the director generals, I find it really interesting that their position is strong because they are using uh, like sociological features that, uh, that would be considered part of a weak state. I mean, they are powerful because they are from prominent families. They are powerful because um, they are being able to, um, uh, to bring in their position their social capitals that are sometimes, com sometimes and somehow related to a specific diploma and uh, a level of, of expertise, but also to the, to, to the good connections in the good society of Lebanon uh, um, of the 60s. So based on the weak state, strong state debate, you use weak state features to be to have a strong position and finally to maintain the state. So it it's super ambiguous. Um, the the autonomy is it autonomous in France? That's. A <laughs> Um, it is autonomous in France uh, in the same way it was autonomous uh, with these director generals. If you are an autonomous uh, entity because you have stronger networks, because you're being able to connect to the, to the greatest numbers of people and to play between them, not because you are uh, entitled by, by law. It, it is because you, you, you've been to the ENA and later on you've been to the Conseil d'État and, and to the very famous and prestigious uh, places that you can accumulate uh, sufficient capital to, to be powerful in your position and to protect yourself and to be able to, uh, to, uh, to leverage some room for action. It, so it's not, it's really, it's really different. The sociological view would be very different from the legal perspective where you are entitled by law to, to, to have this specific position, but uh, well, the, the it, um, it's more related to the book uh, of with, with Antoine Vaucher, but that's why we, we, we showed that at the end that um, the, the people that were crossing the line between public and private, every time they were crossing the line, they were accumulating some new capital. And then they were, when they, were, they returned in the public sector or the private sector, they, they, f they, were more, they were recognized as more powerful and more interesting to to fill a position. Um, yeah, the loss of uh, autonomy and the, the interplay between minister and uh, uh, director general. Um, there is something really uh, weird after, uh, after, at the end of the first Hadidi er era, in 19, uh, at the, the end of the, the 90s, when uh, Hariri is leaving his position and Lahoud comes to power and there is a an anti-Hariri campaign 
And at this point, many uh, seven director generals are indicted, uh, and some of some of them are, are put uh, um, were put in jail. Uh, I think, including only one, the most honest one, of course. Um, one of uh, one of the director general for from uh, EDL also was uh, was indicted, and uh, it showed that. These director general were really the the fusible, and they had no longer uh, enough power to be able to oppose the politicians. And but it was it was really a long process until the politicians were able to remove them to remove them from their positions. And and it was a huge uh, fight uh, between these ministers and these uh, director generals. And they and they won in some certain places because that's uh, the, the the problem is not uh, only of the autonomy. It's also that all the administrations know they are uh, they have a certain way of functioning that is different from the other. There is no coordination. There is no longer any coordination between uh, public institutions, and we don't we don't have data on this, for instance. But if you take one specific institution, you, there will be uh, a director technique, for instance, technical director. That is the acting director general, on the, the guy who's really doing everything on the ground. And then maybe you will find an advisor that has been uh, in, pos in a position for the past 15 years. And he was supposed at the beginning to be an advisor with one minister, and he held the position for 15 years with 20 ministers. You don't know why. Uh, in some other institution, you will find a hybrid um, thing with the PNUD or, uh, or experts. Uh, so it's really different from one situa situation to the other. And we don't have any clear view. And we, don't, we no longer have any inspec uh, central inspection or uh, civil service uh, board that is able to uh, publish like a, a yearly report on what is happening and even the number of people there is in every institution. So there is this problem of the autonomy, but there is this problem of uh, also the, the, the complete absence of any coordination between, uh, between the institutions of the so-called uh, public sector. Did the administration before the war act as a as a cohesion, as a cohesive body? Did they react according to the principle of solidarity? Did they have a solidarity against the intervention of politicians? And now it became like an archipelago, like you explained in your paper, archipel? Um, there was clearly a cohort and a generation of civil servants, whether the elites and uh, or whether the, the the graduates from this institute that w that had ties to uh, that were like uh, related to the others so they knew each other and they worked together and there there are multiple very funny stories uh, uh, during the lebanese wars of you are in charge of a place and your friend no longer has offices so he will come to your place or you will give him a few um, a few offices for for him to for him to work or strategically you will give a few offices to the ISF guy who's looking for a place also for room also and you will get protected uh, in the end. so it's multiple um, uh, interactions and um, bargaining between them and they knew very very well how to how to play uh, on the on this thing no i think they have less and less uh, relations uh, yeah in between relations thank you pierre uh, for the answers and thank you both for these discussions i have a lot of questions but i will not uh, monopolize the microphone unless the audience in the room doesn't have questions so um, the floor is now open for people in the audience to uh, a comment, raise a question. Uh, we'll ask you to please be brief, present yourself before you uh, ask your question. Do raise your hand, don't hesitate. It is a forum for conversation. 
thank you very much, Pierre and panelists, for uh, an insightful discussion that raises a lot of uh, questions. Uh, I'm glad you're documenting this uh, topic and the researching uh, that's very that very important profile of an actor, uh, which is the director general. So um, my question is more related to something you went over quite quickly, uh, what you called the the penetration of politics and the shift to uh, to that I suspect that what you mean there it's like how the state has been um, uh, described as being hollowed out by some scholars that we have uh, um, administrators that uh, leave and others that come in that are more connected to the clientelistic structure of political sectarianism at least that's what we know a little bit about it anecdotally so i'm wondering if you have uh, some uh, information on this you can share how does it happen specifically i mean you, because you presented that the director general is someone who's very hard to remove you in one of the slides you it was mentioned uh, uh, that he and there are often he's right that was another footnote question like do we have any female director general somewhere if if you can also let us know in terms of uh, uh, this gender this domination is it uh, really dominated by males as we see also in the pictures and if not how is it that the sectarian politics was able to penetrate the system. You mentioned uh, just now that episode with Hariri where it seems to have been a top-down uh, intervention uh, and strategy. Was this a major tactic? What were other tactics? But Because we know that the deep state of sectarian politics took over in major ways after the so-called uh, post-war reconstruction phase. So was this, in your opinion, a tactic of uh, that you systematically saw? There's a lot of people working in the administration, or at least in the state. Uh, I talk also about the army uh, globally. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to understand why is there so few public services. Uh, how do you understand this? Um, and uh, what are the reasons for this? Thank you. You maybe uh, didn't really um, introduce the whole Shahabist, like the legacy of the Shahabist era, or maybe the way we come to understand that this was like the moment in Lebanese history, like the state building moment in Lebanese history. And what you do in your work is you particularly like deconstruct that and you really show how how much this kind of image of a state or like this, it was a, a state of images and the way it kind of unravels from within like was extremely interesting for me to hear but what i'd really like to hear maybe more and you also mentioned efficiency and kind of li like these islands efficiency how you also deconstruct this you know so if we are taking a very kind of uh, norm normalized uh, vision like normalized history of the lebanese state that okay what was the shahabist era what did it mean for state building until today and really show us what what his vision of the state and what his vision of efficiency kind of created like what what it hollowed out in itself um even mentioning like all of the the graph behind you it was really fascinating for me to see like what kind of ministry is shab envisioning when you have these very powerful figures on top but you have no you know staff from within to actually make the ministry function so maybe it's a big question but i would like to hear your opinion thank you Okay, I think you have enough on your plate for now. The history of the penetration of politics within the bureaucracy is not very well known, uh, to be honest. Um, I realized in the course of my uh, fieldwork that there were uh, uh, specific uh, dates and periods of time that, that I've never heard about, for instance. The mid-80s, is for most of these director generals that went uh, in po that were in position be before the war, th one of the most important uh, turning points. Uh, after um, the the failure of this the the Amin Jmail reconstruction uh, um, project that we all forgot about that was but that was really important in a, uh, until the end of 1983. 
uh, something is happening with the militias that are penetrating the state and uh, removing some of the director generals. Some some others are resigning because it's becoming, for instance, too dangerous for them. And one of the very interesting uh, threshold is uh, physical threats. And you would think that it had happened before, but no. And that's why, for instance, in the presentation, I mentioned the case of Khalil Salem. Khalil Salem had been killed in the summer of 1976, and there was a very uh, particular uh, event around this. There were two uh, ceremonies, one in West Beirut and one in uh, East Beirut, because all the politicians wanted to associate them with this uh, neutral figure of the middle class guy who became a director general who was coming from uh, uh, they are in the rural uh, landscape. So there was something um, uh, at the beginning of the war touching, uh, uh, physically touching uh, director general was really something shocking for everyone. After 10, it took 10 years to become something that really the militias decided to use on a systematic scale. So it's really 10 years of uh, unraveling of the the social structure that really helped this director general to help power and uh, to help power that long um, the, the on on another note the, the penetration of politics it's really in the mid um, 80s when you hire new some new profiles of director generals that are less uh, able to resist any uh, political pressure, um, so there, th it's really it's really hard to to follow up uh, with this. But it's um, I don't think it's uh, I think there are alternative fu futures when there it it, is, it did not happen. It, it we were really really close. Um, think about if the civil war ends in 1985. What would have had? What would have happened? And really, uh, it's only a matter of five, six years when things are really changing very rapidly, and these uh, uh, people are, are being threatened, and a new generation is uh, is brought in the um, uh, the, the administration. Um, also, something else happened during, like the beginning of the 2000s. There was a new generation of uh, pure. Uh, director generals who wanted to uh, embody this idea of a Shehabi um, um, like stat statement, uh, mostly mostly men, and I will uh, go back to, to this after. Um, so there is a new generation of uh, Alain Bifani and uh, Walid Ammar and all the people that came into power and very recently left their positions and we don't know what uh, what will be the consequences of them leaving their positions because there really is a series of uh, five, six, seven persons that were really in charge of everything and well known and well recognized by the, um, the international institution that suddenly left their positions so, and we don't know what is happening inside these ministries uh, for, for some of them one of the biggest change that we don't know of and th that we didn't keep track of in the recent years is uh, this new generation of women that took over th this position of director general. And I mean, with this specific um, uh, phenomenon, you understand that we no longer have any studies uh, or any uh, monitoring of what is happening inside the um, inside the public administration. Uh, the um, Institute Basil Flehan recently published a study and they mentioned that it, it is 30 to 40 percent of the top management that became uh, female uh, recently. In 2004 it was only 10, 15 percent. So I think it's a, it's a little there is a little disproportion because it's based on the respondent of uh, the study. So I suspect that uh, because uh, some of, some of the these women are are in charge of communication, they were the one who responded to the to the study. But still, there is a major phenomenon, and we don't know much about it, and it should be it should be studied. 
and um, it poses the question of what is the gender of corruption? Will it change anything? What is the gender of sectarianism? And did it change anything to have women at these positions uh, yet? We, we have no information about this. Um, the tough question of a lot of people working in the administration, why so few public, uh, public services? Um, actually, if we go back to this question of the secu security services in Lebanon, it is, um, if you take the point of view of foreign institutions, it is a public service. Uh, you can s read a lot of, uh, um, for instance, in um, um, reports coming from the US on the security sector. They are praising the security sectors, uh, sector in Lebanon for being able to circumvent terrorism. So for them, there is. There is a uh, there is a success story that we w we don't care about if we want electricity and uh, basic social services. But uh, from another point of view, there is something. A um, lot of people working in the administration. We don't have much information about about this actually. A lot of people being paid by the administration. Yes, uh, but when you go to the offices. Um, there's only a few people that are working, and they are working well, given the, the 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 very dire conditions they are in. So it's I don't want to to add on this uh, image of uh, uh, very courageous people, but sometimes you you really realize that there is only one or two persons that are in charge of uh, one sector. Um, related to electricity, for instance, and you have to recognize that without these two people, that would be a lot more uh, problematic than it is today, although we feel that it's already uh, problematic. So um, I don't know if I answer you <laughs> your question, really. Um, um, but I don't have any uh, any better uh, answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, about uh, the legacy of the um, uh, the Shehabi um, era and what vision of the state they had, I'm afraid they didn't have a, a clear vision of the state, for instance. They made it clear recently by rewriting their own history and saying, yes, Shehab was very much of a statement. Uh, but if, for instance, if you take a look at the, uh, the relations between the Shehabi and the private sector, that wasn't a, uh, the, the banking sector and everything, that wasn't a problem for them. Uh, so there wasn't any, um, especially if you take the, if you imagine that they have uh, the, the model of France at, uh, in mind at the, same, at the very same uh, moment, uh, it's really different. They have uh, no problem with the private sector and uh, many people from that know are bragging about uh, the idea of um, uh, having been like one of the more prominent, uh, most prominent uh, director general of the Shehabi era. Uh, they were recruited by, by Shehab from private companies. So they have a very... Uh, a weird uh, and unclear idea of uh, of, uh, of the state, and I, I think Shehab was uh, very pragmatic, and he, he took over at the moment there was a massification of uh, education, and there were people available to take to fill in positions. So uh, he found some allies, uh, and the same uh, the same story happened in in France uh, a few years uh, before with the. The Fifth Republic and uh, and uh, Charles de Gaulle. He he connected himself with um, young graduates, and and that's all. There is no. There, it's really politics. It's not. There is no intellectual clear vision uh, of the states. It was highly, highly pragmatic, and now they are rewriting it as a, a vision that I think wasn't clear at that time. Um. I uh, first thank you so much again for making the time to answer and make us think about all these issues. I, I want to get out a little bit of the Lebanese exceptionalism and relocate the story maybe uh, in a global uh, conversation. The 1950s and 60s were a moment of decolonization. 
in which the notion of state building uh, and the imaginary of being able to build a state um, was quite strong. And um, the 1990s, which correspond with Lebanon's post-Civil War era, are the uh, materialization and unfolding of the Thatcher, Reagan, uh, neoliberal ideologies that start in the 1970s, really with the canceling of the uh, Bretton Woods Accords, but really explored by the 1990s. And what's very interesting to me is we catch that moment where the central state is bad, the local state is great in global uh, NGO, uh, World Bank lingo, and we bring it here and it becomes our big battle. We're going to fight for local elections. And so, to me, so much of this, what is unfolding here is, um, is taking advantage of uh, very uh, proactively and intelligently and overlapping local interests with global discourse and trends that are way beyond us. And so I wonder to what extent we can get out of the Lebanese exceptionalism and think through um, this notion of the state and what happens to the state, and even the fact that violence and civil war are, at the end of the day, a common bread and butter in many places outside uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, my second point is to really bring it back to the urban. And, and there I want to use my own research, but also build on the work of uh, colleagues, including Eric Verde's brilliant work of the 1960s, where we actually indeed understand that moment of the 1960s as a moment of institution building. So it's not just about appointing a director general, it's about actually creating the institutions and passing the laws that will enable that. We know from Eric's work that this is happening already before. It's cooking, there's an imaginary. People are studying urbanism, coming back and setting the grounds for that. But by the time Shahab comes, he is able to use the opportunity. Uh, we know that in the late 1950s, when they tried to establish a Ministère du Plan, there was a huge uproar and people made fun of the actors trying to put that in place. In the 1960s, the war allows Shahab to actually take advantage of this opportunity and establish all these things that were in the cooking. Um, so if we think about it through that, uh, I, I know from personal following these, this period that the, minister, that the environment of the urban and the director generals of the urban are indeed a framework through which people who don't have high social capital, or don't have high uh, family weight, actually penetrate the institutions of the state and get social respectability and social advancement through the state and really become some of the champions we think for, of. So I'm just wondering, like, I mean, how do you fit the urban? Is it an exceptional framework? Because I can start talking about the 1990s and we see that unfolding. Is the urban exceptional in the story of the Lebanese state or, uh, or, uh, or is it actually certain sectors? Thanks. The connection between the global and the local in the case of Lebanon, um, the, we, we lack some studies about uh, the, how the diaspora, for instance, is importing and exporting models from, uh, from Lebanon. Um, uh, it's, uh, for instance, if you take uh, the 50s, 60s uh, that you mentioned, uh, when in Lebanon they uh, created this uh, the the bank, the central bank, and the Bank of Lebanon, there was no mention of uh, post-colonial decolonization. Whereas in the other countries, that was the main thing, creating uh, um, money, creating uh, something uh, that was highly symbolic. In the case of Lebanon, it was created and voila. And there wasn't any public or political debates around this. So there are um, circulations and things that did not circulate in a very strange way that I um, don't uh, understand that should be... Um, Studies the same with the, for instance, the new public management in the in the eighties. Um, I was really surprised when you uh, when you look at how the militias were uh, operating on a daily basis. The main reference was not bureaucracy, especially not bureaucracy. They were despising bureaucrats, and uh, the main reference was the private sector and companies. So that wasn't, uh, there wasn't any mention of the new public management. 
But in their mind, it was clear that the only model to copy was uh, the the private sector, and they did it. Um, and that, that back to your question, your your, your remark with them when you mentioned that the 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 militias at one point operated like um, a post uh, a post service. Uh, it didn't last long, and there was something with many of the militias that you were creating an institution, and then maybe it will uh, go bankrupt. And it will you will close the doors of your institution, not as uh, with a state, really like a company. You you operate, then you close, and then you you create a new one. So there was something of a of a uh, of um, of an idea uh, related to the private sector without uh, this. Um, um, without the necessity of uh, the the model of the new public management. Um, so yeah, for for the for the first question, I'm 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 with you that there is a lot of question that should be asked on this interplay between the, between the two, and unfortunately, I don't have an answer at this point. Um, the, the the specific uh, the urban and the, the this sector of uh, urbanism uh, in Lebanon. Um, we have a lot of it's it is one of the most documented sectors so we have really uh, uh fine uh, fine studies about about this with a lot of details and that we don't have with other sectors so it's difficult um uh it's difficult to compare uh, and, and i and i have no uh, um clear idea as to the comparisons we we could uh, make but if you take for instance the army I think there is also this history of a success for the middle class, for uh, um, for a lot of people that were able to go to the army and to make a position and to make a living and to create um, uh, to create upward mobility for them and for and for the the, the and for the their families with uh, with a lot of institutions building and and uh, clear. Uh, clear setting of uh, of a structure although in the case of the army it's more complicated it's with it because it institution within the institution so the multiplication of uh, of uh, many um, smallest uh, smaller institutions um, so we should I, I hope we will be able soon to make comparisons between the urban and other sectors because it, it would be tremendously interesting the discussion and uh all the issue it um, it raised. I, I had two questions, maybe not to discuss, but to, to have in mind. Uh, the first one is um, what you said uh, with Sam uh, uh, regarding the stat effects, and uh, you know uh, Timothy Mitchell and my dad, and so on, so on, so on. And I was really uh, I read them a lot, and I used them a lot. But nowadays, I'm wondering how to, um, what to do with them uh, today. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a joke, but not 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 only a joke. Where are the state effects? Uh, and it's my <coughs> second issue uh, regarding uh, the debate uh, about uh, urbanism. We spoke about uh, the gender of uh, clientelism and the gender of sectarianism, and. Uh, regarding the gender of the state, but uh, maybe um, uh, the Lebanese trajectory, even if it is uh, really uh, dramatic, could, uh, could appeal us to, to pay attention of uh, not only the gender, but al also uh, of the age <laughs> of the state, and maybe also of the uh, sector, I, I don't know how to say that, but uh, the sovereignty of the state. You spoke about Weber, and you know we know the army, the frontiers, the justice, and uh, so on, so on, so on, so on. But uh, maybe on your on your table uh, here, we don't see uh, where the people are working in what kind of. Uh, and I know that you know that because you work there. But uh, we spoke about uh, social affairs and uh, where and how. Uh, the distribution, the the, where is uh, the civil servant acting in uh, what kind of uh, sectors, uh, and that should be uh, maybe uh, useful for us to uh, 
maybe what I, I've worked a little bit on health during the civil war and um, at this stage of my study I have the feeling that it was really a time for the public health to develop not only in terms of uh, rights for all for all I mean small rights but rights <laughs> access to, to 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 health but also in terms of institutions and of civil I mean in terms of job so um, I, I don't I think that I'm not going to answer. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's broad questions. I said I maybe uh, we have some concluding remarks uh, due to the debate. Yes, what you said, Miriam, is exactly what I was thinking about, especially today. Uh, I think that political leaders and political boss that control the country now doesn't care about anymore about the central state. I wanted to disintegrate to exercise more power uh, and to retain in power so they don't care about anymore even I heard stories that even if someone is affiliated to a political party in an administration they don't care about him a lot they want only to uh, exercise uh, build their own autonomy in their each region that they control they don't need I don't I don't know if that we can say it but they don't need access to state resources anymore to distribute it's it's not enough anymore it's not uh, the exchange rate uh, it's not enough so they will find other solutions but it's it's something debatable and it should be uh, studied really but it's very frightening and very I guess important so some uh, okay, final remarks uh, what Mona said about the director general as being someone very difficult to remove legally. I remembered one legal uh, element. Uh, it's under Sleiman Frenji that uh, a legislative decree, if I'm not wrong, was enacted, giving the government the power to put a director general, I don't know how to say it in English, mise à disposition. So, so it's uh, practically the power to revoke someone, but without revoking him completely. So he loses all effective power, but he continues to have his salary. So it was under Slemen Frenji that this was enacted. And maybe it's Pierre that should have enlightened us about these director generals under Frenji. Were they persecuted? You say no, they were. Uh, they found a way to find a solution, they uh, cooperated, they found compromises. So it's interesting to see how did they cope do you under Slaiman Frenji, who was a notorious anti-Shihabi, and how did it help, did help them? If they coped under Frenji, did they use the same mechanisms to cope under militias during the war to retain their power? So this is an element. A second element about... Uh, civil service 50s what you talked about mona about social mobility and ascension penetrate the state so let me here at the end play a bit the role of the bad guy so Fuad Shab came to power so everyone will tell you that perhaps Fuad Shab politics and uh, especially in economy uh, created a better uh, middle class and so on and so forth but in reality, in Lebanon, we inherited from the French mandate a good central administration and a good employees and public functionaries. It was under Shihab because he was obnubilated obnubile, by the idea that everything should be neutral and we should distribute resources and public jobs to all communities. He introduced in the public function law a an article saying that when we nominate functional employees we should respect confessional quotas so we created more jobs to be distributed through the state but to appease political readers essentially Kamal Jumblat and Pierre Jmail and thus it was the beginning for me of the end of the meritocracy it was he that was the one who introduced the idea that fill the if you want peace give them jobs and give jobs to political bosses, to political leaders. He was able to do so in the 60s because the political regime in Lebanon was not that complicated and the presidency of the republic was able to control more or less. But in time, when the state became more, more challenges happened, especially the Palestinian presence, the loss of prestige of Shahabism and the end of the Shahabism in 1970, what, what Shahab did was 
uh, it's too late. It was too late to salvage. He introduced the, what we have today, what we call today clientelism in Lebanon. He was the first one, sectarianism and cli yeah, sectarian clientelism to political bloggers because always sectarian uh, clientelism existed, but it was not like today. Today it's more horrible. It's uh, like a cartel. So he is the one who introduced it. And generally we don't talk about it. He is, for me, he is the one who is, uh, he torpedoed state building in Lebanon. No one will say it. And everyone who uh, praises Fuad Shab generally, who is who generally who is the one who praises the, 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 the testimony of Fuad Shab? It's a political regime. It's Kamal Jumblat, Pierre Jamey, El Falangist, all those who profited from the regime and all those who are responsible of a great part of our catastrophe in Lebanon, they are those who say that Fuad Shab was and the best president and the solution. It's time to deconstruct the myth of Fuad Shab. And, and that's what I say. <laughs> Thank you on this uh, powerful note and uh, with the hope that we can continue this conversation <laughs> uh, eventually in uh, later discussions and debates and hopefully with uh, even more evidence. I want to thank you very, very much on behalf of my colleague for a very vibrant discussion, uh, extremely enriching. Um, Pierre for setting the tone, uh, Miriam and Wissam for uh, providing a lot of answers uh, and more, even more questions. Uh, colleagues uh, here in the room, I also want uh, to uh, extend my thanks for uh, Mona Harib for putting together this series, uh, Maria, Isabella and Antonia, who's not here, but I'm sure making sure everything is working well remotely um, for all the logistical support, everyone who's doing logistical support in the back, and of course, Ahmed, as always, for the fantastic posters. Uh, we meet again next Monday uh, for another book talk, so I hope you will be with us again, and thanks again, everyone, for being here, and especially, please, a round of applause for our wonderful speakers. Thank you.